Good morning. Welcome to Member Focus Monday. I'm Christina Schaefer, Social Media Manager for HAR. Um, we have a very special guest this morning. We're actually joined by Brad Inman of Inman News. Brad, welcome. Greetings. How are you? Good. Thank you so much for being here bright and early on this Monday morning. <laughs> um, first, if we could just uh, have you introduce yourself. Sure. Uh, so I am Brad Inman. I'm the uh, owner of Inman, which is a uh, global real estate media company that specializes in helping real estate people be smarter about real estate. <laughs> in a nutshell, right? Um, so, yeah. So Inman News and we actually our members actually have a free subscription to Inman News. So we'll talk about that towards the end. Um, because obviously you guys put out some really good information. Um, so you founded Inman News. Uh huh. And um, we're just curious, what is your, you know, it is the preeminent uh, news source for real estate. So what is your role there now? Are you still involved with the day to day? Well, I, sure. I have a really good team. They run the company. Um, you know, we have a really crack editorial team that uh, puts up about 25 news stories a day on the industry, seven days a week. We have uh, an event team that puts on all of our conferences or two real estate connect conferences, one in New York, the last week in January and then Las Vegas in July. Mm -hmm. And then we have Luxury Connect in Beverly Hills in October. And we have what's called Disconnect for CEOs in Palm Springs in April. So um, I you know, try to stay out of the way of a really great team. <laughs> Very good. So we've heard so much about disruption actually in the last couple of years, but definitely this year. Um, we've talked a lot about it on our member focus Mondays and things like that as well. Um, what do you think will be the biggest disruptor in 2019? What should we be looking at right now? Yeah. So what's happening is, uh, consumers are getting acquainted with through a lot of new companies, something that we're all familiar with in other industries. And that's called on demand services where I can, you know, go onto an app and get groceries delivered, get food delivered, I can get a car delivered. Um, you know, all kinds of things are happening with on-demand services. And what on-demand has done is provided consumers with more certainty and speed without compromising the quality of the experience. And real estate has been more or less exempt from that over the years and um, despite all the disruption in other industries. And so, my prediction is that this idea of on-demand services is going to take hold this year and next, or, or 19 and 20. And it started with iBuying. Um, we think mm -hmm. iBuying is buy and flip, but underneath it is this concept of a more efficient marketplace uh, where sellers can you know, sell their homes very quickly and circumvent <clears throat> the mortgage and escrow and, <clears throat> excuse me, some of the things that are really full of, you know, friction and heavy duty labor. And so I think in Houston now you're seeing most of the I buying companies, whether it be Zillow or OfferPad or Open Door or Knock, right. entering that market. And uh, the key for real estate is to get into the flow of this new way of doing commerce of buying and selling homes. Some people sit around and fret and complain that it's the end of the world, but the fact of the matter it's going to happen and agents want to be part of it. And there's all kinds of ways that agents can be part of it. So, you know, it doesn't uh, fly by past them and the opportunity miss. Yeah, very good. Um, so what do you think, and this is kind of about associations, but I think our members would be interested in it. What do you think is the biggest threat to local associations and how can they maybe mitigate that threat? Yeah, I just think associations are like all organizations. Um, I think we all expect, um, you know, a high level of, of, of service delivered, uh, whether it be local government or state government or local or state associations or, um, you know, I think people that pay what I call the taxes, you know, the freight of associations, I think often it's forgotten on the leadership of association who's paying the bills and the everyday realtor, the working realtor is the one paying the bills. So. If the organization isn't, you know, unequivocally devoted to serving their needs, then they're going to fail. Inman has, uh, as you mentioned, a group membership with Houston, and that's that's a real value add that you provide to your members. And uh, for us, we wake up every morning worried about how our members, which you know, are everyday realtors, which like HAR members, uh -huh. how are they going to survive? I mean, we're going into what looks like a downturn. And, 
we all have to be really, really focused in helping agents be successful during this change in the market. And, mm -hmm. uh, you know, that's our devotion every morning. And I think associations need to have that same sort of uh, mantra. Yeah. Um, it's kind of like you were saying with the agents, you know, it's really just about the experience at this point. And I think, you know, kind of what you're saying is if the associations are paying attention to the agent's experience or the realtor's experience as well, just like realtors should be paying attention to consumers, that's how they're going to survive, right? Correct. And I um, hear people in the industry say it's all about the consumer, but uh, the people that are front line with the consumer every day are the agents. And so for me, it's all about these groups, I know it's true of Inman, serving those agents. Um, we're not pretending to be a consumer um, service. We're not pretending to, you know, I think it's just kind of have one consumer first. I don't know what really people that don't have any role in that are even talking about. Um, what's really important here is that the, the front line with the consumer is the agent. And if you're in the real estate industry and in what I call the B2B space and what you're in, then my obligation and duty is to help those agents be successful. Very good. Yeah. So we've heard, you know, in the past concerns about the fate of brokers and MLSs and associations. Um, what role do you see them playing in the next maybe five to 10 years? Uh, which one are we talking about? Brokers well, or owners? Yeah, or? I mean, so what we've heard in the past is maybe a one of them is not going to survive is basically what we've heard in the past. So what do you think of that? And what roles do you see really any of those playing? Yeah, well, there, I think the broker owner is the one that is uh, facing some real threats and the franchises as well, um, because the agent is at probably peak love in the minds of the consumer. And um, I think your generation proves that point in that, Christina, that uh, millennials want to use agents more than my generation. And we're already at 90 percent. So. The agent's role in all of this has been cemented um, over time. I always say that agents, um, you know, outwork innovation to stay ahead of it, not to be disrupted. And so I, it just people want to use an agent. And uh, everyone and their mother wants agents to do business with them, whether it be Zillow buying ads, whether it be Zillow doing iBuying, whether it be Realtor.com, whether it be uh, Compass or Redfin or Coal Banker or Remax or KW, whoever it may be, they're all after agents and agents are the prize. Um, and so then the, let's look at the value chain. So you got the agent, then you got the broker owner. The broker mm -hmm. owner is seeing thinner margins, you know, a new market that's going to challenge them more. Many of them are stuck with really expensive office and infrastructure costs. Um, they've kind of given up the lead game to Zillow and Realtor.com and the lead generation companies. Uh, there's a lot of competition out there for agents, so retaining and keeping them enthusiastic is really challenging, particularly when companies like Compass come on the scene with hundreds of millions of dollars to retain or recruit agents. And so the, the competitive playing field is difficult. Their role is really being challenged. What are they in the future? What role are they playing? Um, but you know, the best measure of all of this is the thinning margins and the profitability picture of many broker owners. Now, that's not to say broker owners are all going away, but those that are going to survive are going to find, uh, they need to find a new role for themselves. Uh, is it technology? Is it services? Is it training? What is it that's going to differentiate them to you know, keep and retain agents? You know, how are they going to deal with the competitive splits that are getting tougher and tougher? Um, it's just a challenging time. And then franchises traditionally have been about branding, but as we all know, every agent I've ever used, I know the name of the agent, but I couldn't tell you whether she or he works for Coal Bank or Compass. Mm -hmm. I really don't know. And uh, most consumers are like me. So the franchises used to be, you know, run television ads, promoting their brand. But now you have Zillow being the most preeminent consumer brand. So uh, an everyday habit and experience like searching Google. And so I think the franchise brands are trying to figure out. That's why KW, you know, Gary Keller's promised to overhaul the whole company. Right. Um, the new CEO of Realogy that's overhauling Realogy. Um, Remax just made an acquisition in the technology sector. All of the franchises are searching for their identity. So in the value chain of real estate, I think the broker owners and the franchises are most challenged and the realtors come out of it all, you know, kind of the, the king of the space. Yeah. 
that makes sense. So along that point, um, do you think there's a difference for luxury brokerages? Um, a lot of people in the industry are saying that, you know, the flat fee and 1% brokerages aren't really making a dent in luxury. Do you think that the luxury brokerages are going to need to adapt as well? Well, there is a thesis that's put out by a colleague of ours who moderates a lot of Connect, Lalia Peters, who came from Wall Street and venture capital, but also is a is um, her family owns a boutique uh, luxury uh, brokerage in New York City, and she has this kind of wonderful combination of new and old. And um, she breaks it down this way, and I really subscribe to what she says that it's going to look a lot like Wall Street, where there's going to be um, you know push a button, buy a stock like E Trade. There's going to be a Charles Schwab that is a combination of you know do it yourself and get financial advice, and then there's going to be heavy duty uh, relationship management like you see often with um, high net worth financial advisors that you know help high end consumers. So you can kind of look at the landscape now and say, hmm, what is the digital one you know push button? Well, it's probably the i buyers. You know, it's probably the open doors um, where someone you know buys your house in 72 hours and you transact and most of it is done, you know, um, in an automated electronic way. In the second tier, you might compare and, um, um, maybe even purple bricks to the Charles Swabs. And then you have the heavy duty relationship ones, which tend to be luxury. But I think this idea that any agent can survive, uh, and, and this is important. The agent will have a role, just which agents will, you know, survive. And I think the agents that are, you know, really obsessed on the relationship, but also obsessed on information and transparency and making sure the consumer is totally informed. You now have consumers that on average, many times are smarter than their agents. So agents have to catch up and they have to be really savvy and smart about this. They also have to offer these same services as the outsiders. You know, I buying now is something that a lot of home sellers are going to look at. And the agent should bring that proposition to the consumer, uh, not waiting for someone from the outside that go open door offer pad. And there's a lot of ways that agents can do that. They just mm -hmm. need to get on board and participate. Yeah, absolutely. So I see uh, we do have quite a few members watching this morning. If you have a question for Brad, uh, you can type that in and, and we'll um, ask him that question. Um, I see actually one question that already came in from Deanna, she said, um, what are specific ways agents can be a part of the on-demand trend? Yeah, well, there is more and more, um, if you look at, Deanna, the, the offer pads and the open doors and the Zillow, each of those have ways for agents to participate. So it's really important you reach out to those companies and find out what are the relationships you can build with the i buying services. I also really believe working with your broker owner, there's not a good agent or a broker owner that doesn't work with investors all the time. And I really think there are programs that can be built by local broker owners to kind of formalize those normal relationships that agents have with investors and make that as part of their listing presentation. Mm -hmm. There's also software companies that are getting into this. Um, people in the CMA business, uh, I'm trying to think of the outfit, Greg Robertson, his is in the cloud. And uh, when you make a listing presentation, he's, he's playing around with a model where um, the seller can press a button and say, yes, I'll take an instant offer. That's then circulated amongst local investors. And then one of those investors may choose to make an offer on that property. So look for the software companies that are kind of going from digital marketing and web, web page development into more and more on-demand services. There's also just, you know, smart contracts, obviously digital documents. You know, these are all things that expedite and make the process more certain. There's also a lot of experimentation going on with virtual showings, which I know scares some realtors, but using bi biometrics and fingerprints and other ways that people can show homes to create, you know, more efficient service. We're also seeing open houses being extended for longer periods of time, you know, a real pro consumer kind of on demand. If you think about it, like if I can see a house on Tuesday, then, you know, with, with not a lot of inconvenience, then it's maybe 
statistically likely that I'd buy that house instead of having to wait until Sunday. So, you know, I think there's a ton of ways and things going on. Um, you know, I would say watch in the news every day because we're reporting on these things all the time. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Um, actually, you guys put out a great article this morning. I saw it in my inbox this morning about it's uh, the real estate agent's guides to iBuyers. So that was a, a great read uh, for anybody that didn't see that this morning. Um, yeah. I would recommend checking it out. That. That, that's a really good report. That's a thanks for uh, reminding me of that. And it's really yeah. go and access. Um, you know, find it on Inman.com. If you haven't signed up for HAR, it doesn't cost you anything um, to to log on and become an active member. Yeah. Um, so if you haven't yet, uh, for those those of you that are watching, if you go to HAR.com slash Inman Select, you can sign up for your um, Inman Select subscription. And again, that's part of the HAR membership. So definitely sign up for that. Um, so, and Deanna said, thank you for that, for that answer. Those were some really good uh, suggestions there. Um, so you're engaged really early on with startups. You know, you have uh, Startup Alley at, at, at the conferences and things like that. Is, is there maybe a startup that you've seen that maybe isn't on realtors radar yet that they should be paying attention to? Well, the one I just mentioned, I, <clears throat> there's so many, you know, there's, uh, Again, there's a migration of real estate software from web pages and digital marketing mm -hmm. into this world of you know, medical, uh, like predictive, you know, analytics where people can predict what buyers and sellers are doing. Um, more and more on-demand um, area, which I think is really, really important. Um, there's going to be a whole infrastructure of companies serving the iBuying community, and I would look out for those. Um, I think. Getting acquainted with all of these um, iBuying companies is so important because they're working with a lot of different companies that agents can work with. Mm -hmm. um, the thing, so the phenomenon I'm seeing is more and more entrepreneurs that are in the on-demand um, iBuying space and um, less in you know the classic web page uh, development. It, we just came out with a story saying that. You know, a web page does little for an agent in terms of generating leads. Mm -hmm. Maybe their bio, but you know, more and more people are using LinkedIn. So, uh, you know, filling out your LinkedIn profile is probably as important, or your Yelp profile, as your own web page. One, they're not going to find your web page. Two, it's a lot to develop and maintain. So, I think you're going to see a lot of changes in terms of the kind of services that the software companies are providing. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, so I'm sorry. Me in the cloud, um, and that's the one that's offering the i buying. I'm not sure if they've expanded beyond their test market, but it's worth following what they're doing. The I'm sorry, that was Cloud CMA. Yes, Cloud CMA. Cloud CMA. Okay, which actually is a part that's um, if you, I'm sure you know, we have the platinum subscription for our members, and that's one thing that they also get access to. Um, is Cloud CMA. So any of our platinum subscribers, you do have yeah. access to that. And you ought to, you know, Bob and gang at Houston Association, you ought to push Greg Robertson to provide that service faster for your members. Yeah. Um, and I would encourage people that are subscribers to Greg say, get, you know, get this going in Houston. Let's, let's not dink around here. You got open door <laughs> in your backyard. So you guys got to get in the front yard and tell your, you know, tell your association and tell your, your vendors to get on it. You know, get me, get me on demand, get me uh, eye buying in my market. Yeah, absolutely. That's what the associations and the broker owners should be doing. <laughs> yeah. They're their hands and complaining about NAR, complaining about this, complaining about that. We should all be focused on delivering these new cool things to our members. And so Houston has always been, your association's always been really good at that. Bob's always been on the, the cutting edge, the bleeding edge of all of this. Um, and he doesn't uh, back off from controversy. So it's, it's really good he does because he's serving the members when he does that. Yeah, well, thank you. Um, okay, so I don't see any other questions from our, from our members coming in. A lot of them just thanking you this morning for the great information um, from our YPN chair. She said, HR YPN loves Inman. Thank you for all you do. <laughs> thank you. Yeah. All right, did you have anything else you wanna share with us or anything maybe that we should have discussed and didn't? No, just keep up the good work. Uh, you got a great association and uh, support your association and also, you know, keep them on their toes. You know, you're paying the, you're paying the dues to pay the, to pay the bills. So, um, 
you know, hold your association accountable and hold your vendors accountable. And, uh, uh, you know, tune into Inman News. Uh, we try to keep you informed of what's happening. We're spending a lot of energy and time now on the changing market, trying to give you tools and ideas of how to, you know, how to adjust your business if the market does change. And, you know, get on board with the whole um, on-demand eye buying. And uh, next year will be a great year. Yes, it will. Actually, before you take off, I do see we had uh, something else come in from Juliana. Um, she said, there's been much discussion about Amazon or Facebook entering the disruptive home buying or market space as well. Um, and she she has a two-part question. So do you have any, I'll go ahead and ask the second part in a second. Do you have any thoughts on that, the Amazon yeah. or Facebook? There's been speculation. Those companies have um, big valuations and they got to generate lots of revenue. They have big audiences, they have distribution, they have lots of consumers. Um, if you look at Amazon, they've been doing some compare and contrast um, mortgage uh, information. They're not in the mortgage yet, but you can imagine that flipping the switch. Um, but you know, this has been talked about with Google and back in the day with Yahoo and they, Microsoft and they put their toe in the water, but they never really got into the business. Um, the last thing I'd worry about in 2019 is Amazon getting into the business. Um, there are bigger threats, there are bigger opportunities. Um, and I understand why people, it, it makes sense and I think it's logical. You're wrong, I'm wrong half the time, but I don't think it's around the bend in the next 18 months in any serious way. Okay. Um, she also asked, Juliana, Juliana, excuse me, also asked if someone had an idea that requires a tech build out, would you recommend pitching it to a real estate software company or to tech developers? That's a really good question. Um, I would just talk to everybody. Um, you know, go to the gang at HAR, you have some really bright tech people there. Mm -hmm. and Let them refer you out to people they trust. Um, you know, real estate people generally aren't um, like I'm not, I'm an observer of real estate. I don't sell real estate and I never have. So I don't pretend to understand it. And similarly here, hiring software developers, which I've hired my share of, you know, that can be fraught with all kinds of nightmares in the road to, you know, delivering a product. So, um, you know, seek some advice from your association if you have an idea. And, um, and then I think you could go to a, a real estate software company. Um, and that might be a better route than trying to hire engineers yourself, if I understand the question properly. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, some of the greatest ideas in real estate tech have come from realtors. Um, you know, they're just so opportunistic and, and they see they see around the bend. They see what's coming because they're talking to consumers every day. And so some of the best ideas come there. Um, becoming a software company is uh, a lot of work. So, um but take that idea and, you know, and, and find partners to build it out with you. Yeah, oh, that's great advice. Um, Nicole's asking about uh, Connect Las Vegas. How will that be in comparison to San Francisco? And when do the tickets go on sale for that? Uh, they're on sale right now. If you go to Inman and go to events and uh, it's, you know, at a very low price, it's, uh, um, I think, bigger, better, bolder is what we call it. Um, San Francisco, <laughs> um, we just got too big for that city. And um, the hotel reached its capacity. And, um, you know, I love San Francisco. It's where I've lived many, many years. But our, you know, the one thing that we heard from our customers is it's very expensive to go there, yeah. to fly there, the hotels, to eat there. And Vegas, there's zillions of flight. It's easy accessibility. You're not going to get fogged in. And uh, the room rate, I think, is 159 you know, versus 289 in San Francisco, the cost of food and transport to everything's cheaper. And so <laughs> it's really a move to, to make it easier for our attendees so they wouldn't have to spend so much money. Um, so we're super excited. It's going to be much bigger. Still have that Inman community and Inmanville, as we call it, but uh, with a lot going on. Yeah. Um, so Trey's asking, and I don't know how familiar you are with the Houston market um, specifically. Uh, but he's asking about the high tier selling market in Houston. Uh, plus it's been said nationally, we're going through a, uh, housing recession or recessing. Um, 
I believe Houston's been in this mode for a year or so already. I don't know if you're too familiar with the Houston market, Brad. Well, I think the way I understood the characterization of the market is exactly what it is everywhere in the country. What I'm hearing from more and more people, and this is kind of unusual, is there isn't a more market that seems to be exempt. You know, mm -hmm. there's segments of the market that are hotter than other parts of the market, but there seems to be in the last two quarters and maybe Houston longer where buyers suddenly hesitated. Um, you know, mortgage money still not easy as it should be. Um, something's going on with a little bit of uncertainty is what I hear from realtors across the country. Mm -hmm. uh, and sellers have been holding on to their prices. And I think what you're going to see now is sellers are going to soften on their pricing and buyers are going to come into the market. We have a hell of a strong economy. We have very low unemployment. Uh, we do have an income gap and we have an affordable housing problem in many areas, but there's just a lot of buyers waiting in the wings. And I think a, a little softening of prices will help those buyers enter the market. But, you know, this could be a longer problem. It's just kind of unclear as we turn the corner to 19, uh, how bad it, you know, it could get or how, how fast it could improve. We've had housing blips and recessions that last, you know, if you go back to 19, I think 1991 um, during the Gulf War, but, you know, it was like a 12 month blip. And then we have, you know, the 10 year kind of did from the national recession in 2008. This feels like something that's, you know, that, Makes sense. We have an affordability problem, price too high, sort of stuff. There was an inventory problem, but now we got inventory coming on. Bring up the inventory or sensible pricing. I think you'll see buyers in the market. And rates were going up, and that obviously is a big issue. And it looks like maybe they're flattening out. You know, they're they're slightly under five percent on the thirty-year fix. So I think there's some. You know, generally rates are not too high, and the economy is good, but mm -hmm. there's a lot of and a lot of buyers on the fence. Yeah. Um, Shane was asking, um, do we embrace Zillow uh, or do we push back uh, from marketing, or excuse me, push back from marketing with slash through those companies? Many people feel they're a threat to realtors and associations. Yeah, I think, like it or not, Zillow's here to stay. And uh, the day's long gone for us to think about somehow unraveling, uh, unraveling their role. They're a powerful mm -hmm. consumer brand. But individual agents and broker owners have to make their own intelligent business decisions. And that is, if they're generating high quality leads that can be converted to customers, invest. Um, if, uh, if not, don't. And if you have some ideology about them being in between you and your customer and don't like it, don't give them any money. And um, it's, it, to me, it's just a sensible business decision but the idea that Zillow is going away um, or that there's something can be done to get rid of Zillow because you don't like them, uh, I think it's you know not going to happen. Right. And Zillow does provide a lot of pretty important services to the consumer. And they also provide a lot of services to agents. And they're going you know, increasingly end to end. You know, it, people used to say, oh, Zillow is going to get in the trend, into the transaction. And I said recently, Zillow is the transaction. They're buying houses through iBuying. So yeah. over it, they're not going away. And they got a lot of data. And um, you know, they stumbled recently with their stock price. And they've had other woes. But uh, I can't see a day when Zillow's going away. So I, I wouldn't spend a lot of time trying to get rid of Zillow. It seems like your time's better spent either working with them or using your own channels to get your customers. OK. Um, and this will probably be the last question we take here. I know I want to be uh, mindful of your time this morning, Brad. Um, Chris is asking, most buyers are focused on payment. So if prices go down and rate goes up, the monthly payment is mostly the same. Do you think there is enough of an influence on price or rate that will compare, um, excuse me, compel buyers to enter the market? <clears throat> yeah, I, I, you really just nailed it there. You know, it does just come down to what your monthly outflow is and, mm -hmm. uh, and I think that um, I think we're hearing that rates could flatten out. And if I think they flatten out up next year and prices come down a little, that might be the magic you know window for um, some accelerated transaction. Um, you know, more inventory just means, and it's happening pretty quickly, that there will be 
um, you know, some softening. And so it's just how much, but you, the, the matrix that he put forward is exactly the challenge because it is monthly outflow and, mm -hmm. uh, you know, it is affordability. All right. Well, thank you so much, Brad. This has been really informative. And again, thank you for your time. Uh, again, to our members that are uh, listening, hair.com slash Inman Select, sign up for your free Inman Select subscription. It's part of your membership. Um, and, you know, check out those articles like the article we mentioned this morning, the iBuyer uh, guide, which was very informative. So uh, make sure you guys are doing that. Thank you again, Brad. This Take care. And hello to everybody in Houston. I love your I love your city and I love your association. <laughs> well, thank you. We love having you. Bye bye. Right. You yeah, have a great week. Bye bye. So for our members that are still watching, thank you again. Um, next week, we will have a year in review. Um, so be sure to tune in for Member Focus Monday next Monday. Thank you. Bye bye.